Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for our time together once again tonight. Uh, Lord, we just pray that your word in James chapter 3 will be uh, a word for all of us, Lord, something that we can uh, meditate on and think about and pray about in the uh, coming hours and days. And Lord, just uh, thank you for uh, the men's hearts here that we're able to come out tonight. And I pray, Lord, that you would um, bless each and every one of us in our unique, special way, what we need to hear from your word tonight. Lord, we pray for the ladies that are also get ready to start their study in the adjacent room. Uh, we'll just be with them and bless and encourage them as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Alright, well, Joel was just here, but he had to leave to take his son uh, to a late night outdoor soccer practice. No way. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be a little chilly out there. <laughs> Holy. <laughs> yeah, so... If you didn't know, go ahead and turn in your Bibles or electronic device to James chapter 3. The last two weeks, uh, Joel has been leading up to chapter 3. He did chapter 1 and chapter 2 already. Uh, he may have done uh, a short overview, so I'm going to also just give a quick synopsis of uh, James. Um, this epistle of James is kind of what I might say a, a how-to book of the Christian life. Uh, it's one of the most practical books that we see in the New Testament uh, because it offers instructions and exhortations to Christians who experience problems as we all do. This epistle or letter, letter is more practical than doctrinal, I would say, although the major doctrinal theme that you can see throughout this whole book is about faith and works. Uh, there were four men with the proper name of James uh, in the New Testament that we read about. I won't go into the other three, but it's most probable uh, that the author of this epistle or this letter is the half-brother of Jesus. That's the James where most people claim that uh, is the author of this book. Uh, and if he is the author, uh, it's kind of noteworthy that he did not mention his relation to Jesus uh, anywhere throughout this book. You know, he didn't say, well, my big brother, Jesus, or anything like that throughout the whole book. Um, so that's what kind of leads it up in the air a little bit uh, about which James of the four in the New Testament that this letter might be attributed to. But it's most likely Jesus' half-brother. Uh, this same James also became the leader of the Jerusalem church. Uh, this book of the Bible may be one of the oldest, or close to one of the oldest of the New Testament, uh, written uh, most likely around the year 46. Uh, what I noticed in my study of Bible was probably between 42 to 50. So I just kind of picked a date in the middle. Um, so it's uh, in that neighborhood uh, of the age, which again would make it one of the, the older ones for sure in the New Testament. With this letter, James was uh, sounding, I guess what we call a wake-up call to all Christians, saying, get your life in line with what you believe. Get your life in line with what you believe. Could be a, a call line, I guess, uh, that James was uh, trying to mention or say throughout this whole um, book. So with that short synopsis, I'm gonna just jump into chapter three and read verses one and two. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If Anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. So James is warning others about being a teacher because of the stricter judgment uh, that comes with being a teacher of God's word. Uh, but he uses the word we to include himself also, uh, not just other teachers. So he's uh, understanding and recognizing that teachers uh, will have a more stricter accountability uh, at the judgment seat of Christ that we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, as I just mentioned, teachers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ someday and be judged a little bit more strictly than others, the Word tells us. Uh, their greater influence, teachers' greater influence, uh, translates basically into a greater responsibility. Uh, their greater influence also comes with more accountability. So with leadership comes responsibility is what he's kind of alluding to here. And let's go to 2 Corinthians 5 to see where this judgment seat of Christ comes up in Scripture. Verse 10, 
of chapter 5. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Also here in verse 2, James is being um, slightly humorous or a bit facetious uh, by saying we can be a perfect person if we uh, don't stumble in word. And if we can do that, if we, if we can somehow get past the point of not stumbling in word, then we must also surely be able to control our whole body. But like I said, it's kind of humorous because I don't think there's been anybody, anyone since Jesus that's been able to control our tongue, control our mouth, control our body uh, since the day we've been born. Uh, we always find ourselves <coughs> saying something uh, that we wish we didn't have said. Uh, a couple times throughout this teaching, I'm going to refer or, or also show uh, the New Living Translation verse just because sometimes uh, I think it helps us not understand, but just read in a little bit more modern language. So some of the words are slightly different, uh, which makes it read sometimes better. So the same verse uh, in the New Living Translation says, Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. So notice the, the big if there that I highlighted in red. Um, again, that's why I was saying thinking, you know, James was just being slightly humorous because he knew what he was about to say wasn't something that anybody was able to do. So the idea is that we should try to put our brain in gear uh, before we put our mouth in motion. We need to really try to control our tongues. Uh, King David even shares how difficult this is. We read in Psalm 39, verse 1, to the chief musician, even to Jeduthun, a psalm of David, David, I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle, while the wicked is before me. And Solomon, uh, King David's son, Solomon, the wisest man, Scripture says, probably to ever have lived, also said this in Proverbs 15, 1, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So a soft answer and is attributed, I mean, it, it comes forth by using our tongue. So being real careful on how our tongue is used can oftentimes turn away wrath. Uh, it can help subdue conversation that might lead into an argument. Um, so, and then in the New King James, or following up there with 15.1, as the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. So the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly. So that Proverbs 15.1, the soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Uh, I, I was thinking to myself, man, that's pretty good plaque material. <laughs> if you're going to make a plaque, that'd be a good plaque. Uh, that should probably hang somewhere in every bedroom. Or that plaque should be on a rear view mirror. Or maybe that plaque should be hanging somewhere in everybody's kitchen. You know, it seems like a, a lot of arguments can either take place uh, in your car, talking to the backseat driver maybe, or talking to the person that just cut you off in traffic, or talking to your spouse or kids in the kitchen. Um, so you know, having that plaque up and in the forefront of our vision uh, may help uh, turn away uh, anger. All right, uh, verse 3 and 4. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. So James gives two illustrations now of how large things like a horse or a ship can be controlled or maneuvered uh, quite easily by something else that is relatively small. So most of us are probably, it's kind of a, a gruesome picture of this horse's mouth, but for those of you that haven't been around the farm in a while and haven't seen a, a horse's bit, uh, it, it looks like it could be quite painful because it's really pulled into the back of a horse's mouth. Um, and it kind of prevents them from eating anything while they're also being used to, to pull the wagon or whatever, you have the, the bit in their mouth. 
but it doesn't take a whole lot of pull. I mean, is anybody, forever, for those of us that have ridden a horse, you know, you can pull right on the reins and they go right. You pull left on the reins and they go left. Um, so it, it's a very effective means of maneuvering a horse. Um, and then you see the other um, photo of a, that rudder down the lower left hand corner of the that goes back and forth. Uh, the pilot of the ship or the boat um, has controls to make it go left and right. And the ship is big, all controlled by hydraulics, I'm sure. But you're seeing just a very small portion of this ocean liner or whatever it is. This is a very huge boat controlled by a very small rudder. And this bit in relationship to this horse's body is very small. So he's giving these kind of these two illustrations as he's about ready to lean into talking more about the tongue. And our tongue, in proportion to our body, again, is a very small member of our body. <clears throat> so verse 5. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest, a little fire, kindles. So this little fire is speaking of our tongue. So the previous two examples that we just kind of looking at, the, the horse's bit and the rudder of a ship, lead up to this other analogy of how small our tongues are, but how they can play a role in causing so much damage. Uh, I'm sure we've all had the experience of saying something uh, which the tongue helped with that we really wish we could take back. Uh, you know, you can't get those words back as soon as they're out of your mouth. You know, Pastor David and I'm sure others from the stage have talked about this same thing and given the illustration of saying something and you kind of start reaching out for those words and you, know, you just can't get them back. Once they're out there in, in space, they're, they're, you, you can't retract them. Once they've been heard uh, and out there, you just don't get them back. And unfortunately, our tongue is ready at all times to be used and it can go off uh, in the wrong direction quite easily and quickly if we let it. It even comes with its own cage, our mouth, uh, yet we still can't subdue it completely, can we? Um, yeah, it comes with its own cage. And so much damage can be done with this little member of our body. Uh, it doesn't even have a bone in it. Have you ever thought about that? Most of our body parts, our members, come with a bone. They give them structure and support and strength. But wouldn't it, I mean, wouldn't it be great um, if we could actually break our tongue? Sometimes, uh, just like we sometimes break a leg or break a finger or break an arm, we can break our tongue. You know, if we said something out of line that was horribly cruel or sinful, you know, after we had our tongue in a cast for several weeks, uh, maybe then we'd have uh, learned a lesson about what we had said using our tongue. Um, but I've never seen anybody yet today walk around with a cast on our tongue. Um, but that would be interesting if we could. Uh, James here says, you know, the tongue can start a fire. And James tells us, and once that fire has started, essentially, it usually leaves a lot of damage in its wake that can't be easily fixed, or at least easily repaired. Um, so many times our tongues can do damage emotionally um, to individuals. Uh, I don't think your tongue will ever do physical damage, uh, unless a person takes what you said and then does something themselves to hurt themselves. Uh, but our tongues can easily do emotional, relational type damage. And that's what we're talking about here, that sometimes that damage is not easily repaired. It may be irreparably uh, damaged. So verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it's set on fire by hell. An uncontrolled tongue, or what we would call not having a filter on your mouth, is not thinking through something before you launch into saying something. Um, we've all experienced that ourselves, and we probably know somebody in our life that we've actually probably said, don't you have a filter on your mouth? Or something along those lines. We've probably constantly been around them, and where they're constantly getting themselves in trouble by what they say. Uh, and you sometimes maybe suggest, I, I know I have to a couple people, mostly people at work that I know, um, you know, suggested about doing something about the filter on their mouth <laughs> because of usually foul language uh, that they're using. This uncontrolled tongue 
we often exhibit uh, can defile our whole person. You know, we see in movies sometimes, uh, but I, don't, I can't think of a personal example where someone said something to another uh, which was received as so hurtful that those two people have become estranged from each other for a year, a month, or even a decade. Um, you know, you, you probably heard stories or certainly seen it in the movies where uh, a father and a son, they just have some sort of horrible fight. Uh, so at, that's at, usually at the beginning of the movie, and then something happens in the middle of the movie where they start to grow that bond and relationship back, and now by the end of the movie, after not seeing each other for months or a year, now, now they're back in good terms with one another. Uh, but as I shared, you know, at the, the, the men's breakfast this past Saturday, uh, a lot of times when two people are going parallel with one another and they have a disagreement or an argument, they start going off in different directions, then they have to have some other course correction, uh, you know, that sit-down meeting, that come to Jesus meeting where they have a, an understanding that they come to and then now they can kind of reconverge and then start walking on that same parallel path together once again. Um, but again, all that trouble usually starts because of our tongue, something that we've said inappropriately, wrongly maybe, maybe we said something that was just not factually true, um, someone was in, either insulted or embarrassed or who knows what we have said to cause harm to others. And another example, um, has this ever happened to you where you saw maybe a beautiful and attractive woman all dressed up, just looking fabulous, you know this could be in real life or this could be in a movie, um, and then she opens her mouth. Try to get a picture in your mind of, you know, in a movie or someone you met in town, in the grocery store or wherever. She was just like, beautiful. And then she opens her mouth and out comes something foul or disgusting. Um, and then, the, like it says, or, and that whole beauty personified just kind of melts away because of what comes out of her mouth. And that's almost the way I feel like when I see maybe a a beautiful person on screen or in real life, and then they dig into their purse and pull out a cigarette and start smoking. I, I just hate smoking. Uh, so I just, no matter what she looks like, as soon as I see that, it's just kind of, uh, darn, why? Uh, it just, you know, the words can do the same thing. It can really uh, take away from somebody's beauty, attractiveness, uh, just whatever you might think well about them. Um, as soon as they can easily defile themselves, uh, their whole body, like all what James says here, just because of the words that they use. So let's read about this a little bit more in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. It says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. So here Paul is wanting us to, again, be real careful about the words that we use, and make sure that the words we use are going to be good uh, for necessary edification, for lifting somebody up rather than tearing somebody down, is the idea of the words that God is giving us. So another um, illustration of how our tongues can be used in dramatic fashion, I'll give you just two people's names, and you'll easily be able to see well, how one person used them for horrendous purposes and how another used them for God glorification purposes. Adolf Hitler, Billy Graham. No, they each had relatively the same exact tongue in their mouth. And they were able to, obviously because of the spirit in their body, they used their mouth so radically different. So it, it's I guess that comes down to kind of a different teaching, I guess. It's not necessarily the, the member, the tissue, the tongue. It's controlled by essentially, you know, our heart and our brain. Uh, this little member can be used for so things so bad, like Adolf Hitler used his tongue for, and they can just conversely, they can use for, be used for things that are so good, like Billy Graham was able to uh, share the gospel with so many millions of people during his lifetime. So verse 7, 8, and 9. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. 
It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men, who have been made in the similitude of God. So James is pointing out that all the animals of the earth, the sea, and the air have been tamed or subdued by man. For instance, we can go to a zoo and maybe get a ride, a ride on a tamed elephant. Or we can go to that same zoo and maybe get a ride on a tamed camel. Um, we can go to SeaWorld and see the tamed Shamu do tricks in the water in front of us. Uh, we can buy a parrot, get it tamed, and teach it good words or teach it bad words. Um, all these different things have been tamed or subdued by man, like James is talking about here. Then he points out that there has been no one perfect person besides Jesus himself that has been able to completely control their speech their whole life. Only the work of the Holy Spirit within us can bring this destructive force under somewhat control. So isn't it sort of strange, though, how this tongue we all have in our mouth uh, can so quickly praise God and encourage some, and within the span of a few minutes can despicably curse and beat down someone else? Uh, you may have witnessed this also, uh, hopefully not here within the church walls, but how so quickly uh, someone you're talking to at, at Walmart or someone you're talking to at work or fill in the blank, you've heard someone just miraculously bless somebody with what they're saying and then 5, 10, 15 minutes later they're cutting down somebody else because of what they were saying or what they did. So again, just so quickly our tongue can go from one huge blessing to one huge person. And if that's the same person doing it, unfortunately, there's something going on in their heart too that's uh, something that needs to be called into action to, to change that, because we shouldn't <laughs> dramatically switch that quickly. But I think we've probably seen examples of that. Verse 10, 11, 12. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? Or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. So James here is pointing out how we, as humans, are able to use our tongues to do good and bad things, or to bless and curse in nearly the same breath, as I was just alluding to. So contrary speech, meaning when you say something good and then almost immediately say something bad, you know, a blessing and then a cursing, uh, within almost the same breath, it, it, that's only going to produce negative results. He then points to, a, to nature here to give two examples where nature does not even allow contrary results. So, for example, pouring salt water into fresh water, you're going to yield a mixture of salty water. Uh, he goes on to mention that fruit-bearing trees only bear after their kind the one type of fruit that they were made to produce. So apple trees are always going to make apples. Uh, grapes are always going to make grapes. Fig trees are always going to produce figs, and so on. And then he finally answers his own question, saying, yes, a spring, it's only going to yield salt water or fresh, neither, both, at the same time. None of those simultaneously. Verse 13. So who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. The solution for the problem of, of controlling our tongues, at least to some degree or temporarily, is to seek um, divine wisdom. We see in Scripture where and how this can be done. If we go to James 1, chapter 5, which Joel read for us uh, two weeks ago. In the New Living Translation, it reads, If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and He will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. I heard it said that wisdom is the application of knowledge. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. Uh, many people that you and I know may be full of knowledge, but lack wisdom. Uh, a 
again, I'm sure we can all probably think of an example of someone we know uh, that just sometimes says the weirdest, maybe not the weirdest, but for lack of a better term, the stupidest things you, you might think, or just uses their great vocabulary or uses their great knowledge inappropriately. Uh, they just aren't applying godly wisdom with the, the knowledge that maybe God is blessing them. So just having a lot of knowledge doesn't necessarily make a person wise. I also like how verse 13 reads in the New Living Translation. So let's read it here. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. Verse 14. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. I guess the best way to explain this is to be real careful before you speak. Or as some would say, we should be slow to speak more often. We should be slow to speak more often. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. So here James points out clearly that where envy and self-seeking exist, there is confusion and evil. He also says that envy and self-seeking are earthly, sensual, and demonic. That's pretty strong language, especially considering or when we consider how often we might engage in a bit of of envy ourself. And again, I'm sure everybody in this room at some point in time has exhibited or shown a little bit of envy. And just so you know, the definition of envy is a feeling of being discontented or a resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions, their qualities, or maybe their luck. So their luck, their qualities, or their possessions, often we could probably look back on the situation where we were envious of that in someone else's life. And James is saying, when that is present, we're being earthly, we're being uh, sensual, maybe even demonic. Uh, but again, that's why I said it was pretty strong language, because uh, I know we probably all felt envious at some point in time in our life. Verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. And in the New Living Translation, but the wisdom from above is first of all pure. So the word blue on the screen here, wisdom, now everything that you see in red on the screen is just kind of a, what James is telling us, a more of an understanding of what pure wisdom or what true wisdom is. He's saying it's pure. It is also peace-loving. Wisdom is gentle. Uh, wisdom is willing to yield. Wisdom is full of mercy. Wisdom uh, sometimes employs good deeds. Wisdom has no favoritism, and wisdom is sincere. So that's a whole lot of good things that come with pure, godly wisdom. So I don't think I can even try to elaborate much more on this verse beyond what it already states uh, so clearly, at least in this, in, in whichever translation of the word uh, you read it from, if there's just so many good examples of what wisdom is and can be. Verse 18. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Once again in NLT. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. So with these last two verses, 17 and 18, we see great instruction or revelation in what type of conversation we may be having. Meaning if we sense some envy from ourselves, us, or the other person that we're conversing with, 
or there is confusion occurring in the conversation we're having, you can maybe be assured that an earthly or self-seeking conversation is taking place. So if there's envy or confusion taking place in the conversation, uh, it may be best to take a little prayer walk or try to redirect the conversation. It's because you might also agree with this, that it's much harder to have a peaceable, gentle, and non-partial conversation. To try and employ all of those type of uh, attributes to a conversation sometimes take, takes effort and work to make it peaceable, gentle, non-partial. Um, I made two phone calls today that before I made them were not very easy phone calls to make. Unfortunately, I guess I would say that both phone calls ended up in just a voice message because the people I was calling, they both didn't answer the phone call. So instead of waiting for them to maybe call me back, I just left a unlikely voicemail. Um, and it was kind of a, a tough matter to address with both of them. That's why I would have rather it to be in person. But I, I didn't see him here on Sunday. And I, did, I tried to call him, talk to him on the phone, but they didn't answer. Um, so I had to leave the voice message. So it, those conversations could have gone really difficultly, or they could have gone really well, depending on how I presented myself on the phone, and also how they were going to receive it. So in that case, when you're not looking at somebody face to face, it's very hard to have a good phone conversation because they don't see body language, they don't see facial expression. All they hear is my monotone voice coming over the phone, and it doesn't uh, help uh, express empathy, empathy, or care, or love, or mercy. Um, but they both responded afterwards, and both conversations ended up being received very well. So, uh, praise the Lord that the words that I did share in the voice of mission seemed to, seemed to be received well. So that worked out well. But like I said here, it's much harder to have a peaceable, gentle, and non-partial conversation. Um, you have to kind of work at it sometimes. Uh, those of us that are married, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes when you're having a conversation about something, it's weird. Margaret and I have sometimes fights. Yes, we do have arguments. And it's not the drop down, get out the pot and pan type fight, but just a, a verbal fight type thing. And it, it's usually very short and quick, and we get over it pretty quick. Um, but it's over the weirdest little things, like the temperature in the house. You know, how hot should it be or how cold it should it be in the wintertime and in the summertime. Um, and, and I could go on and on about different things. Um, loading the dishwasher, unloading the dishwasher, blah, blah, blah. But it's just weird sometimes how over the years of being married, you have to um, be real careful with your words. You know which are, are hot topics or hot buttons you can push. Uh, so you try to avoid those. Um, and I think all you guys know what I'm talking about. So it's, conversation sometimes is not as easy as one would make, or one would think it is. So sometimes fewer words is the best approach, and that's usually my approach. Um, so they probably knew I'm going to ever uh, catch me in the hallway going on and talking for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Uh, I'm usually somewhat straight and to the point. Hopefully not abrupt, but um, courteous and short-winded. <laughs> um, Margaret sometimes wishes I would be more elaborate and spend more time conversing. Uh, and I'm practicing that. And, uh, over the 26 years of marriage and now, I, I talk more, on it, more now than I ever used to. So that's, uh, that's a good thing. So I'll close uh, with this verse in Proverbs 10, verse 19. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his lips is wise. I think I already maybe read this verse 48 years ago, and that's why I don't talk too much. Sure <laughs> <laughs> you did. Yeah. <laughs> Not true, but uh, I've read this verse many years ago and thought, yeah, I, I know who this verse could apply to. Um, and it's applied to me on occasion, but I, I just find the... A lot of, oftentimes using fewer words is to my advantage, put it that way. So, I always try to end with a life lesson. 
um, it's a little bit out of joint from the, the teaching. Um, here it is anyway. True peace is the presence of God. So peace can come from you know using our words wisely and trying not to purposely get into any type of argument. Um, and so when we use our words carefully in a situation like Proverbs 15 1 was talking about, you know, a soft answer turns away wrath. So again, using our words um, correctly, um, mercifully, lovingly can cause peace uh, in our life and our relationships. Um, and to be able to do that, I think you need the presence of God, the Holy Spirit in your life. So true peace is the presence of God in your life. He allows us to use our words the way we want to, the best of our ability. Um, so it's oftentimes a good thing to pray maybe before a, a difficult upcoming conversation. Um, before I made those phone calls, I was walking the hallway at work and um, saying a quick prayer as I was walking, you know, just help this conversation go well and the Lord heard my words and the voice messages that I just told you I left and seemed to be well received. So, with that, let's close. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for our time together. Uh, once again tonight, going through this uh, shortish chapter. Uh, so, Lord, I just uh, pray, Lord, that, that there's something that was uh, brought up here in the uh, few uh, 18 verses, Lord, that we can maybe think about as we drive home tonight. And uh, help us, Lord, to use our conversation, to use our words uh, in an honoring and glorifying way. To the person we're speaking to and to you as well at the same time. Lord, because you know uh, you're present during all of our conversations. So Lord, um, help us to, to cry out to you uh, before those difficult calls, those difficult conversations to, to allow us to exhibit and portray you in our conversation. So Lord, again, thank you for our time together. I'm blessing each and every man here tonight. And those that weren't able to make it, Lord, I pray that They'll maybe uh, listen to the teaching as it's uploaded uh, someday soon and uh, would also be uh, just enjoy uh, hopefully what uh, they heard in, in these teachings as we go through the book of James. Uh, again, thank you for these men. Keep us all safe as we drive home uh, tonight. And Lord, just bless each and every one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.